Hey there, folks, and welcome back. In our last lesson, we introduced the notion of a vector field, which is a function from Rn to Rn. Over the next several weeks, we're going to be doing calculus with these vector fields, starting with a discussion on integration. But before we even define what it would mean to integrate a vector field, we're going to introduce a new type of integral for the functions we're already used to working with, scalar fields. This new type of integral, called a line integral, will give us an idea of how we should define the integral over a vector field. So back in Calc 2, you learned how to integrate over an interval, right? You learned how to integrate f of x from a to b. In our course, you learned how to integrate a multivariable function over a two-dimensional or three-dimensional region. We're now going to do something sort of in between. We're going to take one of these multivariable functions, whose graph might look something like this, and instead of integrating it over a 2D region, we're going to integrate it over a curved line living in its domain. We're going to refer to this type of integral as a line integral. So maybe my curved line looks something like this. We'll call it C. To define the integral, we're going to use our motivation from Calc 2. We want this integral to compute the area under our surface but above the curve C. We want it to compute the area of this curtain shape. So how should we do it? How should we define this integral? Well, back in Calc 2, you define the integral by chopping up your region into a bunch of tiny pieces, and on each piece, you estimated the area using a rectangle. We are gonna try the same thing here. We're gonna chop up our region into a bunch of tiny pieces, and on each piece, we're going to say, OK, this is just an approximation, but my area is pretty close to the area of this rectangle, which is the height of our function at some point, f of x i star y i star, times this tiny change in width at the bottom. Now, back in Calc 2, that change in width was called delta x, right? It represented a tiny change in the x direction. But now we're not just moving in the x direction. We're moving along this path. So our tiny change is really a tiny change in arc length, right? It's delta SI. S is commonly used to denote arc length. So there you go. This is an approximation of the area of one of our slices. At this point, I think you know the drill, right? We add up the approximations and let the number of slices go off to infinity. That's going to give us the true area of this curtain, the area under our surface and above the curve C. This, folks, is going to be our line integral. We denote it by the integral over C of f ds. ds reminds us that we're adding up over a whole bunch of tiny, tiny arc lengths. Of course, the question still remains. How do we actually evaluate one of these line integrals? Like, if I were to give you a function f and some curve C, would you be able to compute this integral? Probably not just yet, because we're not used to computing integrals with respect to arc length. Usually our integrals are with respect to x or y or maybe even a parameter t, but not usually arc length. Okay, well let's think. What do we already know about arc length? We've talked about arc length once before in our course, way back when, when we discussed parametric curves. There, we said that if we had some parametric equation r of t equal to, say, x of t, y of t, with t ranging between a and b, then the arc length of this curve is given by the integral from a to b of the square root of dx by dt squared plus dy by dt squared dt. We had this big, ugly integral, right? This integral represents a sum of really tiny changes in arc length. Ah, really tiny changes in arc length. That's exactly what we're dealing with here. So our tiny changes in arc length are given by this expression here, this nasty square root times dt. Okay, let's take a step back and see if we can put this all together. We know that we can handle arc length if our curve is described by a parametric equation r of t. Currently, c is not, but if we could find a parametric equation to describe this curve, then we could use our arc length formula. We could replace this ds, which we don't know how to handle, with this big ugly square root dt, which we do know how to handle. So now our goal is clear. 
we want to find a way to describe our curve C using a parametric equation. If we could do that, if our curve C is traced out by R of T, with T going from A to B, then our line integral, the integral over C of F dS, can be written as the integral from A to B of F of, well, X is going to be X of T, Y is going to be Y of T, and then we replace dS with the square root of dx by dt squared plus dy by dt squared dt. This is an integral in just one variable t, something that we've known how to handle since Calc 2. Okay, enough with the theory. Let's put this formula to use in an example. All right, let's see if we can evaluate this line integral over the curve c of y squared plus x ds. Here c is the arc of the unit circle in the first quadrant of R2. Okay, now I remember from the last slide that the key to evaluating these integrals is to first parametrize your curve. So here we're dealing with an arc of the unit circle, and if memory serves me right, the unit circle can be parametrized by cos t sine t. So let's write this down. C is traced out by the curve R of t equals cos t sine t. Of course, we don't want to go all the way around the circle. We just want the arc in the first quadrant, which is going to correspond to t between 0 and pi over 2. Believe it or not, the hard part is done. We've parametrized our curve, and now we just apply the formula from the last slide. The integral over C of y squared plus x ds is going to be the integral from, well, t equals 0 to t equals pi over 2. And now we're going to replace our x and y with these expressions involving t. y squared is going to become sine squared t. x is going to become cos t. And what about this ds term? Well, ds is going to be replaced by that square root, the square root of dx over dt squared plus dy over dt squared dt. Of course, we do know what x and y are. x is cos t, y is sine t. So we get the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of sine squared t plus cos t times the square root of d over dt cos t squared plus d over dt sine t squared dt. On the next slide, we're going to clean this up and evaluate our very first line integral. Here's our formula once again. We need to evaluate our derivatives, clean up our expression, and compute our definite integral. So first of all, the derivative of cos t with respect to t is going to be minus sine t. The derivative of sine t with respect to t is cos t. So we have the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of sine squared t plus cos t times the square root of sine squared t plus cos squared t. And of course, we know this expression is 1. So this gross square root just disappears. This gives us the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of sine squared t plus cos t dt. Much friendlier. I'm now going to use a trig identity to handle this sine squared term. I'm going to write this as 1 minus cos 2t over 2. So I have the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of 1 half minus cos 2t over 2 plus cos t dt. At this point, I'm ready to take my antiderivative. I have t over 2 minus sine 2t over 4 plus sine t, all evaluated between 0 and pi over 2. Now notice that if I were to plug in 0, everything would disappear here. So I'm really only going to worry about the upper bound. I get pi over 4 minus sine of 2 times pi over 2 over 4 plus sine of pi over 2. And at this point, I can realize that, well, sine of 2 times pi over 2 is going to give me sine of pi, which is 0, and sine of pi over 2 will give me 1. So I have a final answer of 1 plus pi over 4. Okay, folks, here's a little visual of what we've just been dealing with. I've included the graph of the function z equals y squared plus x. It's this curved sheet. And I've also included the arc of the unit circle living in quadrant 1. 
By computing the line integral over this arc, we're really finding the area under our surface and above that arc of the circle. It's the area of this curtain you see here. That area was found to be 1 plus pi over 4. In the next video, we're going to try out some more examples, but let me end this discussion with a couple important remarks. Firstly, I could have parametrized this arc of the unit circle in tons of different ways. The good news is, if we're computing the line integral of a scalar field, which is what we've done in this video, the integral doesn't care how the curve is parametrized. The one caveat here is that you can only go around your curve once. You can imagine that if we were integrating over a circle, well, then going around once is going to compute the area of our curtain, but going around twice would compute double the area of our curtain. So if you're only going around once, you can parametrize C in whichever way you like. This in particular means we could have moved in the opposite direction in the last example. If C denotes the arc moving in this direction, then typically we use minus C to denote the arc moving in the other direction. What we've just argued is that the line integral over C is equal to the line integral over minus C. This is true provided that we're working with a scalar field. As you'll see in the next couple lessons, line integrals over vector fields are a little different. These properties break down very quickly.